the World Vegetable Centre. As I talk, I'd like you to listen to me, bear in mind what Richard said, because we have a much looser model, a very open model, and we don't use the same microphone. <laughs> we don't use, oh, that's better. We don't have a set model. I think that'll become very clear to you. And just to put it into context, Please note that we are a global institution. We work on global vegetables and traditional vegetables, so global ones, your tomatoes, your cabbages, and so on. Um, the traditional vegetables are anything from pak choy to African eggplant to savory cabbage to moringa. We also work from research to development. Excuse me, I'm swapping over here. Research to development, that whole continuum. And we're not a CGIR centre, we're a non-CG international centre. And we work along the whole value chain. So from genetic resources, to breeding, to production, to post-harvest, to nutrition, we cover the whole range. And my job is to make sure that we have impact everywhere, on everything, throughout the value chains of all the vegetables, which is a huge job. And what I'm going to do in this presentation, which I have very limited time for, is to give you five examples where we think we've done well, and then as I talk through them, look at the geographic <coughs> scaling, the issues, and try and pick up on what Richard said of the key things which are affecting the scaling. So I'll go first to tomato grafting. Why do we need this? Well, many of you possibly grow tomatoes. It's easy to grow tomatoes. It's incredibly difficult to grow them well, especially if you have soil-borne diseases such as uh, bacterial wilt, if you have nematodes, root knot nematodes, for example, or you get flooding. Temporary flooding, I don't mean six meter high flooding that lasts forever, but a couple of feet of flooding which will go away after two or three days. So the aim is to graft your preferred tomato variety onto a resistant rootstock, which could be a tomato, or it could be an eggplant, or it could be one of the other Solanaceae. And the impact of that in a trial is you get your tomatoes here, no tomatoes at all in a bacterial wilt infested field. So as you see, all my slides will have a list down here with countries or innovations to look at. In Vietnam, a highlight, we trained one person, Dr. Vin, back in 98, a champion. He went back and started to introduce grafting in Landon and the Red River Delta. We're talking a long time scale here, so please note how long this is all taking. So we trained him in 98. By 2012, we found that we had 100% adoption in Landon, which makes actual analysis quite difficult. The economists could probably agree with that, because we have nothing to compare them with non-adopters. 100%, 48% in the Red River Delta. That is because they do not have as much bacterial wilt in the Red River Delta. And the profit to the tomato growers is close, very obvious, even in the Red River Delta where the bacterial wilt is not as prevalent. But then, so we have a champion who took the technology back and spread it. And unfortunately, only one champion, not a group of champions. On a small scale, it's important to know that when you have a technology, you might have to adapt it. The technology in Honduras in 2000 was a rootstock that would control root knot nematode. However, the problem then became bacterial wilt. So we had to introduce bacterial wilt and nematode resistant rootstocks. Your technology can't necessarily stay stagnant, stable, whatever word you want to use. If we look at Bangladesh, <coughs> The introduction within the USA project we have there was for a different reason. It was for empowering women. Um, we have grafting introduced. They do have pest and disease problems. They have climate problems for tomato production. And we found small nursery growers, women's groups, are able to do grafting. Women are often much better than men at doing grafting. It's a very fitly job. It's very good for these women because it only takes an hour or so of their day and they have a very busy day 
although their husbands may probably disagree with that, they are incredibly busy. They're looking after the families, providing the food, and so on. They're actually able to produce a few grafted seedlings. There is a need, the demand is there, whether they can continue to supply it, we don't know yet. They need some business training and they need to strengthen their groups. Please note, they're adapting to local conditions. I'll mention this again later. In Indonesia, in the project there, we also have some grafting and some nursery operators have started to pick up the grafting technology. The demand is there if they know that there is a solution that they can have demand for. So a lot of it is getting the information on what the grafting will control, what it will cost them, and what their benefits are. Again, we have adaptation and experimentation by the farmers and the nursery producers. And we don't mind about that. We're very happy for people to adapt to suit their own needs, whether they're adapting at a very small scale like this, you'll see the national program copies our original very well. But real people in the real world can't use that. They're doing different things. Big commercial nursery in Vietnam, for example. Small scale in Bangladesh. Uh, we believe there's no one size fits all. Moving on to the next thing, integrated pest management. This is a bit of a more scientific issue. Eggplant fruit shoot borer. It's a very destructive pest, reduces yields significantly. The easiest way of controlling it for a farmer is to spray and spray and spray. However, if you use integrated pest management, if you can eliminate crop residue, if you can cut off and destroy borer infested shoots, then use traps based with sex pheromones. They're the pheromones from the females that attract the males. So we capture all those males and keep them out of the way. And it will allow withholding of pesticide use, not eliminating, withholding. It's very difficult to get an elimination of pesticide use on a plant. So the technology of these pheromone traps, some of which look very odd because they're a little bundle at the top with a long tail of plastic and look quite bizarre as you'll see in a minute. One of the key things was to let people understand what they were doing to their health, what were they were doing to the health of their families from all these sprays. And we had to do that and to give them a solution with all these technologies of uh, mass media, including things like puppet shows, which are great fun, but actually went right into the minds of the farmers and they understood what we were trying to say to them. And the reason that you want to introduce IPM for eggplant particularly, because I would not eat eggplant in South Asia. Pesticide sprays, after the IPM, these sex experiment traps were introduced, Originally there were about seven, three sprays a week, two, but the number of sprays now is more on the one side. And you'll see that in Bangladesh, they were spraying uh, 110 times in the growing season in the summer. Now, 33 times. They were losing a lot less yield as well. 30% fruit damage compared to 75%, less labor needed. Although 110 sprays of toxic pesticides, we were trying to reduce that. It was only possible through private sector participation to create the pheromone lures themselves, to produce the traps in a way that the farmer could use. We had some small entrepreneurs in 2003. By 2005, nine enterprises were selling the traps. And just some quick figures here. Uh, two of the enterprises had tripled their production and the unit cost had fallen from a US dollar per trap, which is unreachable for most of the farmers, to 10 cents per trap. It's doable. The private sector took it up, went with it, the demand was there. I don't know where we're at at the moment, that was 2005. Vegetable accessions and breeding lines, perhaps not a target for you, but I want to point out that for much of what you do, this new material is critical. We have a lot of material, and the key point is we work both with the public and the private sectors. However, individuals make a big difference. This is in Nicaragua. Thomas Laguna was part of a project, USA project, 
screening vegetable lines. The project finished, he was motivated and continued and has screened many thousands of vegetable lines, producing kits, seed packages for local farmers. However, additional funding, seed funding at the beginning, additional funding later can sometimes push <coughs> the outscaling to go much further once it has become sustainable on a slightly smaller scale. Our material goes around the world, which is great. We have a variety of releases. We don't release material, it's the public sector. However, in using the private sector to disseminate the material, the difficulty is the private sector will not tell you what germplasm they've used, where they've sold it, and the amount of seed that they've sold. So it's very hard for an international center to get the data we need to quantify impact. Home school gardens is very important for women, for children. The aging agricultural population in horticulture too is an issue. We're targeting school children for nutrition and as an income opportunity and to try and get kids to understand that agriculture is cool, it's okay. We have school gardens in India, uh, sorry, home gardens in India funded by the Sarat and Tata Trust. And scaling out is done by NGOs. We don't have much control. We have a nice plan. We originally had seed kits, but now the NGOs are taking the gardens out themselves. And nobody follows the standard plan of how you should plant. That's OK for us, too. Bangladesh, we have a lot of homestead gardens. But we did start with Helen Keller. That was how we originally started. And perhaps you should look at it and wonder why we had to restart again under this current USA project. What was the issue and why? Why did we have to do it again? One of the key innovations this time is to have small seed packs. The farmers, the ladies can't afford the bigger seed packs. The smaller seed packs can often do the job. And we do provide basic information. They get some seeds, a watering can, some instruction for a day and understanding how to cook the vegetables for their families. We're trying to empower women here as well to take decisions for them and their families. In the current uh, project we have in Indonesia, the USA funded project, we also have school gardens going out. And the interesting thing is that the uh, Assessment Institute for Agricultural Technology in Bali is taking the school <coughs> gardens out of the project framework into new regions. For us, that was a great sign. Many other countries linked with ASEAN. We have an ASEAN ARDC vegetable network, so Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Philippines, influencing policy so that um, in the Philippines, school gardens are mandatory in 42,000 public schools now. And we like to feel we have a little bit of influence in that. And part of it is making sure that kids and the policymakers understand that vegetables and growing vegetables is a cool thing to do. Use actresses, use uh, boxes like Mani Pacquiao to show vegetables. Then the kids start learning, going, oh, it's a good thing to do. Uh, Myanmar, Uzbekistan, policy again in Uzbekistan, a decree, decree on um, vegetable gardening in schools. And something that we've been caught out with, the link between health, vegetables, nutrition. It's really difficult to prove. We know that eating vegetables is good for us, but prove it. It's really tough. So we have a project now working in six countries, four target countries for new school vegetable gardens, which will be Bhutan, uh, Burkina Faso, Nepal, and Tanzania working with existing systems in the Philippines and Indonesia to try and understand this correlation between school gardens and nutrition. How long that will take to give impact, it's going to be a long time. We've got stack randomized controlled trials. We're hoping by 2018 to reach 2,400 schools. And then we're hoping that neighboring countries will also pick up and encourage school gardens in their countries. This is one crop which was considered to be a non-starter. Scaling up, not everything is scalable, true. Mung beans were in the 70s. 
we had to ensure they became high yielding, had synchronous um, maturity, so all the pods ran at the same time. They mustn't shatter because you lose the seed. We had to reduce the growth period and increase resistance to pests and diseases. Then we had to tell everyone they're really good for you. They're good for the soil. They provide micronutrients and protein, improve soil facility, diversify cropping, and so on. A huge network of partners that were, in Richard's terms, sort of uncontrollable. They did their own thing. However, with some shuttle breeding, some networking, seed village program to get 2,700 tons of seed, we now have an increase in the area under the Mung Bean, which has increased significantly in Bangladesh, China, Indonesia, Myanmar, really huge, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Thailand. That was from something that nobody knew they wanted, except for those that wanted Mung Bean sprouts. Um, if I just go through this, I'm sure if you want these key points, you can get a copy of the presentation from whoever's got it. But the key thing I would like to just say to you is we believe there's no single solution or mechanism. You saw the same technology going to different countries in different ways, and it was always different. We're happy with that, but I don't think everyone's comfortable with that. It takes time, and time is not what you have. You need to do something pretty fast, but we think it takes a lot of time, patience, we think if you get adaptation, you will get sustainable adoption. We don't want a technology to go in and then when you go back, it's not there anymore. So we think some adaptation is good, <coughs> informed adaptation. And because it's going to take a long time for sustainable impact, we need to factor in some short-term impact opportunities too, so you can document them for the administrator and your partners. Thank you. To learn more about scaling and how you can contribute to this growing body of knowledge, please visit agrilinks.org slash scaling.